Welcome to the Samuel Family Living Room. I hope this week of preparing for celebrating the resurrection of our Lord this coming Sunday has been blessed. Today is Good Friday, and it truly is a good day, because on it we remember our Savior's willing sacrifice on the cross for us. You know, I have many memories of Good Friday from when I was a child. I grew up attending an historic Lutheran church um, that had a strong liturgy. And during Good Friday, things would change up a little bit. There was a period during the service every year where the church would dim the lights, get almost pitch black, and the pastor uh, would take the heavy pulpit Bible and he would go up to the altar at the front of the church and all of a sudden you'd hear boom, 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 three times. He would slam that down on the altar. It was shocking to a young child. But really what the purpose of that was a, was a visceral image, a picture of what Jesus said and what he meant in his final words on the cross when he said, it is finished, or more accurately, it is accomplished. But the question that leaves us with is what did he really accomplish? What is the cross for us? And today, rather than look at the story of Jesus' crucifixion from the perspective of one of the Gospels, I want to reflect on a single verse from the book of Romans that expands on what the cross means for you and me. The cross itself is not a beautiful thing. It's an ugly, messy, heavy, bloody, burdensome thing. It was an instrument of torture and execution that was used by Rome in the time of Jesus. So it should actually sound somewhat ironic when I say that the primary emotion which caused Jesus' suffering on the cross was not wrath, but love. I don't say this to diminish the reality and justice of God's wrath towards sin. For to speak of God's love without an appreciation for his justice is to diminish love to mere sentimentality and rob the cross of its power and its meaning. Rather, my desire is to emphasize the primary place of love in understanding the reason for Jesus' suffering on the cross. Let's look at Romans 5.8. It reads, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, there's a notion that we can fall into sometimes when we think of our own sin, and it's perpetuated in some things we may read or hear, that wrongly positions Jesus as dying to secure the ability for God to love us when before his obedient death, God's orientation toward us was wrath for sin. That's what we believe when we stumble in sin and think of God's burning anger towards us. It makes us hard to approach him as our father who loves us. As with any falsehood, it's rooted in a truth. And in this case, the truth is that sin makes us God's enemies. It breaks relationship with him in a very real, significant, and costly way. But it's impossible to read Romans 5.8 and believe that Jesus somehow stood in the gap to make an angry God love us. For what does it say but that the love of God is what motivated him to send Jesus in our place. The love of God is what motivated him. The love of God toward his people comes before, it precedes and motivates the willing sacrifice of Christ. Christ's death on the cross is not the act of God the Son on the one hand, who loves us, making God the Father, who doesn't, able to love us but of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect and complete unity, executing a plan that he established from the beginning of time 
to redeem people who ran from him and to call them back into loving relationship. You see, God determined from the beginning of time to love and save a people for himself. And that's what motivated the cross. The reconciliation of his people to himself. We have a glimmer of this in Jesus' words from John 10, 17. When he says, curiously, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. You see, it was part of the plan all along. And it was Jesus' obedience to that plan that satisfied the Father and gave him joy. That God the Father and God the Son would work together to bring us to him. God loves us, really, by taking the dagger of his righteous justice and wounding himself with it, rather than the people he loves who trust him by faith so that you and I could be knit to him in loving relationship. Now we're left with the question, if this is what the cross means, then why does that matter to you and me? Why is it significant? Well, first of all, nothing could matter more. If you've set your faith in Christ, the one who made you and formed you has shown his love for you by redeeming you from the curse of sin at great cost to himself that you might know and experience his love and reflect it out to the world. For love like this, in a way that mere sentiment could, could never accomplish, love that gives, love that serves, it demands a response. Without the cross, God's love would demand nothing of us, for it would give nothing to us. You know, when we think about our present moment, a time of fear, a time of anxiety, a time of suffering that we're going through right now. We need more than empty words. When you're sick, when you've experienced loss, when you're enduring grief, the mere trite sympathy of thoughts and prayers on social media just don't cut it. We need a savior who dives into our mess willingly, bears the pain and the suffering, gives of himself to give us an eternal hope that is unshakable. Brothers and sisters, that's what the cross of Christ brings us. A Savior who delivers to us at cost to himself the promise of hope and a future. A future in one whose love makes all the difference in the world. In Christ's work on the cross, he hasn't given us mere sentiment. He's given us all. So we can sing with joy the words of one of my favorite hymns, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And that refrain, love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. So what is the cross? It is the true demonstration of God's self-denying love to his people who've trusted in him. Amen.